All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so again, welcome to Supper with Space Scientists. So this is a lecture series that is primarily for community college students, um, and it's from UC Berkeley's Space Science Lab. Uh, and these lectures, they're going to be on the second Thursday of the month, every month at 7 p.m. PST. Um, and it's going to be at the same Zoom address every time. If you do want to get direct emails about these in the future, once again, please do fill out the, the interest form that is in the chat. Um, every time we're going to have different speakers speaking about a cool space science or engineering topic, um, as well as talking about how they got there, so their career path and and just sort of their journey and interest in space science. And there's going to be plenty of time for you all to ask questions and feel free to ask about either science or career at the end of the talk. Um, you'll notice that you're all muted and we do ask that you leave your videos off throughout the meeting. Um, this lecture is going to be moderated by Tim Quinn, who's one of the hosts here. So whenever you have questions, please send them to him and he'll be directing them to our speaker at the end of the meeting. Um, and so then without further ado, here is Tim Quinn to introduce the Space Science Lab and our speaker this evening. Thanks, Claire. Um, good evening, good evening, everyone. And welcome to this talk. Um, I wanted to start to talk with sort of showcasing the Space Sciences Laboratory where Claire, David, and I work and, um, and sort of what we do. And I, I, I posted the link to this website which I'm sharing um, for the lab. And I, I really encourage you to go ahead and peruse the website. There's a lot of content here about what we do. And also, you can also uh, send in, if you're interested in working at the lab, there is an avenue for um, you know, sending in a, uh, an email to the lab. So if you look at the, the front here, it, it goes through what we make, what we do, and who we are. And basically, we're a group of space physicists, engineers, uh, technicians. And we build a variety of space-based space, uh, space instrumentation that, that either gets launched by a rocket, a balloon. Um, and there is even some uh, ground-based observations that we do. And, um, we go all the way, you know, one of the, one of the places we get most of our um, funding is from NASA. So those spacecraft you might have heard about, like MAVEN, which is over near Mars, um, Parker Solar Probe, which David is going to talk about tonight. Um, and, but that's just a few of many. And, you know, the lab has been going, has been around since about the early 1960s. And there's many, many missions that have been worked on and um, are, are being worked on right now. And for instance, uh, I'll share with you, this is uh, the website for Parker Solar Probe. And David's going to talk, his talk tonight is, is, is based on the work he did on Parker Solar Probe. Um, and some of the, you can see some of the statistics there about, about, the, um, about the, the spacecraft. And it is orbiting the sun as we speak. Uh, it was launched about two years ago. We made, it made its sixth orbit close, uh, it's in its sixth orbit around the sun and it just made its most recent close approach uh, just in September. And I think David might even show you some thermal information about that close approach when it gets really, really hot. Um, Go back to space science. And um, I don't think there's much more I want to say. I, th I think given, you know, your interest in space science, I really recommend going through this, this site. You can see that uh, the type of research is here. We even have our own mission operations um, at the lab where we actually fly satellites um, so, or, or spacecraft. You'll, you'll hear satellites and spacecraft, those two words inter used interchangeably. Um, and we actually have a, a, a dish that we communicate with spacecraft from um, at the lab. And so mission operations basically are, is the group of people who 
control and operate a spacecraft. And so that, that's been going strong since, gosh, about 2000. And um, there's more on the website, an overview of student opportunities at the lab. And this picture is a, is a good representation of some of the student opportunities um, that are available. Here is, uh, this is a balloon launch or a balloon mission where if, as you look at this picture, you see a, it's a really, a, it's really the mixture that really composes a mission at the lab. You have graduate students, you have undergraduate students here, you have electrical engineers, and you know, that sort of gives you an idea of the flavor of the breadth of folks working at the lab. I could really go on and on about the lab and um, let me see, is there anything else I wanna mention before David starts his talk? Um, but again, uh, and my, my, back, and my backdrop here is, um, is the, of my screen is Parker Solar Probe on the launch pad at <coughs> Cape Canaveral. Um, and um, you know, one of the things that opportunities you have if you were to become an engineer, technician, uh, scientist at the labs, you get to you get to go to Cape Canaveral and watch watch some pretty spectacular launches. This group, the group uh, you see in this photo, got to go to um, Antarctica to launch that balloon. That what they're what they're standing in front of is a the payload basically that was attached to a balloon that. The balloon would take it up high enough into the atmosphere, probably over 100,000 feet, um, to do some observations of cosmic rays. And um, all those folks got a free trip to Antarctica. And if that's what you're interested, you can get a free trip to Antarctica. <clears throat> all right. Well, I think with that said, I'm going to turn it over to our speaker. Let me introduce David. So David Glaser. He's a mechanical engineer at the Space Science Lab, and he'll discuss his work on Parker Solar Probe. It's a mission that's, as I mentioned, in orbit right now around the sun. And it was considered the first mission to touch the sun, um, not literally, but uh, it, it has gotten closer to the sun than any other spacecraft has ever gotten before. And, and due to that fact, engineers had to solve problems with protecting the spacecraft from an extreme temperature environment. Um, so David is going to talk to you tonight about what he did and what the other engineers he worked with did to try to protect um, the instrumentation from, from that harsh environment. So I am going to go ahead and stop sharing. And David, turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, thanks for the introduction and welcome everybody. Um, I want to say first that uh, really since the beginning of the pandemic, my heart has gone out to the students um, because you're involved in um, striving for your aspirations during a, a time that is so difficult. And, um, and I congratulate you for, for sticking with it and pursuing your education during this difficult time. So my talk's going to have uh, two parts. I'm going to, uh, the first part is like biographical. Um, tell you the path that I took um, to get where I am now. <clears throat> and the second part is I'm going to talk about some of my work on an instrument that's on the Parker Solar Probe mission. So you all heard the question, what do you want to do when you grow up? Um, and to that I would add, when do you actually grow up? Uh, in my case, it, I guess it was when I was around 40 years old. Um, as a kid, I was always really interested in science and engineering topics. Um, I always wanted to be something um, along those lines. And when it came to the time to graduate high school, um, I was most interested in biology and I wanted to be a biologist. And I did go to college for that. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I got some good research um, experiences. But when I graduated, I, I didn't have enough motivation to go on and get a PhD, which you really have to do if you want to be a scientist. Um, I did a number of different jobs in my early 20s, and I ended up um, being an instructional aide in a middle school where I was tutoring English learners 
Um, and so I went to them, I went to all their classes with them, um, science, history, English, math, and, um, and I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and after four years of doing that, <clears throat> I decided to get a teaching credential. And then I became a, a seventh grade science teacher. And almost immediately after I started teaching seventh grade science, I fell in love with space because that was one of the topics that I had to teach. And I just ate it up. I, I became so enthusiastic. Um, the internet was just starting then. The, the World Wide Web was like two years old. And NASA already had a lot of really cool stuff on it that I wanted to share with my students. Um, and um, I guess you would say I became a, a certified space nut. And I spent so much time and energy creating um, creative things for my students to do. And uh, one day, probably in like my third year of teaching or so, a student raised her hand, Mr. Glazer, yes? When can we stop learning about space? And, and that was kind of a, a pivotal moment for me because I, I had to stop and think, you know, was I, was I overdoing it just because I loved it so much, more, much more than my students? I'm not saying they didn't enjoy it. I think that a lot of them were very enthusiastic about it. Anyway, um, as, things went on, as time went on, I decided to stop teaching. And I was so enthusiastic about space and I asked myself the question, could I participate in this instead of just being a spectator? And um, I decided I was gonna give it a shot. And uh, did I wanna be a scientist studying space or an engineer? And, and this time I chose engineering. I think that I had learned some things about from my first college experience that I, um, <clears throat> that engineering was a better fit for me. So um, at the age of 34, I took calculus in night school and started from there and figured out what classes I needed to take to apply for engineering school. I took a lot of classes at UC Berkeley um, through their extension program um, so that I would be prepared to, to um, apply as a junior, similar to um, what community college students often do. And um, that took several years. I was working at that time uh, as teaching science, but in a, in a museum, not in a, in a classroom. And um, when I was 38, I got accepted to Cal, but only after I was rejected. Um, and I was devastated. Uh, they don't tell you why, they just send you a very short letter that says, thank you for applying. We had a lot of great candidates and you weren't chosen. Um, and thanks to my aunt, who said, don't take no for an answer, write an appeal letter. Um, and so I did. Um, and my mother had just passed away and, and it turned out that was related to why I didn't get in. I had to drop out of two classes um, when she was very sick. And uh, so I wrote this impassioned letter explaining everything that I'd been through um, to wanna to be an engineer. And um, they wrote back and they said, okay, we'll accept you. You just have to take these other two classes that you dropped out of and then we'll let you in. And so that was, that was a, a real moment of elation. Um, so in engineering school, uh, Berkeley does not have aerospace or, or much of anything um, in terms of space engineering. So I wanted to get as many experiences as I, as I could. And I did two internships. I did one internship at NASA Ames and I did an, a summer internship um, at the Space Sciences Laboratory. Um, I didn't know that I would end up getting a job there later. I also had a student job during the semester, which was um, very repetitive, kind of boring work, but I was getting to touch and handle real um, equipment that was going into space. I had to, to check the electrical resistance of 20 points on dozens of um, little electronics boards. But I know that all of those went into space later and worked. And so I, I played a small role in that. Um, I also did a senior project. I was advised by um, uh, a NASA engineer that I spoke with to do some kind of independent project um, with engineering. After that, I graduated and I got two jobs um, in quick succession. Um, in small companies um, down in Silicon Valley that were doing NASA contracts. But in both cases, 
the, the project's funding was canceled um, in midstream. And in both cases, I was laid off from these jobs. Uh, one job lasted three months and the other one lasted a year and a half. And I was pretty dispirited. In fact, I was ready to just throw in the towel with space. Um, and I did two things. I applied for a whole bunch of different mechanical engineering jobs. And I also applied to get for graduate school at Cal um, to get a master. So I had two possible um, paths to take. Um, I interviewed for a lot of really interesting jobs. Uh, mechanical engineering is very broad. Um, a company that makes filters for water purification, um, a company that designed LED lighting system for businesses, a company that was um, trying to develop a robotic, basically a robotic snake-like robot that would be used um, to, to examine and do surgery inside the colon. Uh, I interviewed at PG&E um, for a job with uh, working on the electrical grid, grids. And um, of course, I didn't get offered most of those jobs, but I, for example, I did get offered the job at, at um, PG&E. Um, and then around the same time when I was trying to decide what to do, I did get into um, graduate school at Cal. And I decided that even if I didn't want to do space, I did want to be a design engineer. And so I went to get my master's at Cal um, just two and a half years after I had left there. Um, I wasn't planning to do space, but at the end of my first year, somebody emailed um, the professor who was my advisor, somebody from the space sciences lab, and said, do you have any graduate students who know how to do SolidWorks CAD software and would be interested in working on a satellite project? And if we accept them, we'll pay for their tuition and, and also a stipend. So I went up and interviewed with them and um, they offered it to me. And so there I was back in space and uh, it turned out really great. I, um, my first project was working on a CubeSat. Um, I'll, hopefully I'll get a chance to show you a picture of that. And I did that as my master's project for a year. And afterwards um, I was offered a job. And, and so here I am um, still 11 years later and enjoying it very much. Um, I'll show you a few pictures of um, some of those experiences. Okay, can you all see that? Looks good. This, this was my uh, internship in 2003 um, at NASA Ames Research Center. The project was called the Mars Underground Mole and they were trying to develop an instrument, a device that would hammer its way into the soil on Mars. Um, so there's a, there's a mass here and a spring and a mechanism that cocks the spring. And it's essentially like a self-propelled pile driver. And I got my first experience um, using CAD software, SolidWorks, um, to design all the parts. And then I got to build it and do a little bit of testing. And um, I put this picture in um, because these are all test engineers. That's all they do at NASA Ames. They don't design things, um, they don't do science, but they test. And um, I discovered that I really liked doing that um, as, I, as I worked there and got to know them and, and that will come up later. This was my senior project. It was another mole that was meant to um, penetrate into the soil on Mars, but this one was supposed to use vibration instead of hammering. Um, and I, it was a great project. I got to do the electronics and the software and um, design and machine all these parts. Uh, and then this, my internship in 2004 at the Space Sciences Lab was with an infrared interferometer telescope. That's a facility that we run that's in the mountains in Southern California and it's three telescopes that are um, <clears throat> that all join their signals to get really high resolution images of stars. And my task was to build a piece of test equipment that they would use to calibrate their, um, uh, their signal line. And then uh, I mentioned that my first project um, at the Space Sciences Lab that I did my master's on and then continued on afterwards was at CubeSat. These are really becoming really important um, miniature satellites. Um, 
hundreds of them are launched every year now. And um, this was quite early in the, in the history of CubeSats and, and it was a great experience to, um, to get to design and participate in the team that, that built that. Okay, so that's my uh, bio part. And uh, the second part of my talk, I call it engineering away the heat on solar probe. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about a little piece of the work that I did, um, which is how we designed it and tested it such that it would, the instrument that we build would survive the high temperatures. Uh, if you remember from the, um, the website that, that um, Tim showed, you saw a short video of the um, Parker Solar Probe approaching the sun and the shield turned red <clears throat> and that's this shield. Um, it was signifying red hot. And, um, but this is a, a view from the back. And so the whole spacecraft is behind the shield and these four things sticking out are um, antennas. And um, I was part of the team that designed and built those antennas. So I'm gonna take you back to 2008 with a blank whiteboard, which is often how projects start. This was before I joined the project. Um, but um, some solar scientists at our laboratory convened a meeting, and this, I'm making this up, but it might have happened something like this. Convened a meeting with engineers to talk about a project that they wanted to do. And so the scientist says, NASA is planning a mission to touch the sun, to go closer than any other spacecraft has gone to the sun before. And we solar scientists have been waiting for this mission for over 50 years, but the technology simply didn't exist before. But NASA now thinks that it can be done. They have an idea for a spacecraft, and most importantly, um, there's a shield that's going to protect the spacecraft from high temperatures that's made out of a new material called carbon-carbon foam. So we want our research group to be part of this mission. We want to measure the electric field near the sun because that is a, a key part of understanding how the sun works. So what we want to do is put a set of antennas that stick out beyond, beyond the shield so they can measure the um, electric field. There's, I show two in this picture, but there's two more that are at right angles. And then the electronics will be behind the shield, the, the little blue boxes. So they'll be protected and they won't get so hot. So one of the engineers asked, so how close to the sun are, you, are we talking about? And so the, the scientist makes a little sketch and he says, this close. That's five solar diameters away from the sun. And in case you didn't know, where we are, the Earth is 107 diameters away from the sun. Mercury is um, somewhat over 20. So this is really close to the sun. But that's not the key piece of information. What, what, what we want to know, what the, what the engineer wanted to know is what is the intensity of light at the sun? And the scientist says 650,000 watts per meter squared. And there's silence in the room. That's 650 times as bright as on Earth. It's like trying to blow dry your hair with a flamethrower. So we go back to our whiteboard and uh, the engineer, one of the engineers said, well, that, I think it's gonna get pretty hot there. You know, how about if we tilt the antennas back like this and they'll be behind the shield and we can take our electric field measurements there. And the scientist says, yeah, we thought of that. We, we did our analysis, we did our calculations and it's not gonna work. And then another engineer says, well, how about back here? It's far from this, it's not um, near the spacecraft. They're nice and long, but they're behind the shield. So they won't get so hot. And the scientist says, sorry, we, we checked that one out too. It's not gonna work. This is what we have to do. So we want you to come up with a design that is going to do this so that we can present it along with our science plan to NASA so they will fund our project and we'll get to be part of this historic mission. So um, in summary, these, this is what the engineers were tasked with. Two meter long antennas that stick out of the shield are exposed to the sunlight, but the electronics box has to stay below 90 Celsius, which is a little lower than 200 Fahrenheit. And no part of the um, antenna can melt, warp, or break. 
So the engineers go back and the, how, how in the world are we gonna do this? And um, there's a number of ingredients that go into our work. And the first and the, the basis really of, of our engineering is physics um, and, our, and our understanding of it. And in particular, um, we're talking about the physics of heat transfer. Uh, and there's these four simple rules that got, govern what we're trying to do. And that are, they are um, heat travels from a hot place to a less hot place, doesn't go the other way. In space, heat travels by radiation, as in the sun radiates light, it, it travels all the way across space and then it heats the earth. But in the antenna itself, what, whatever materials it's made of, heat travels by conduction. <coughs> And if you add insulation inside a structure like the antenna, you can slow the conduction of heat. So that's the physics we have to work with. And then the other ingredients are the experience of the engineers, everything they've done in their careers, um, building things that work in space, their creativity, and very important is their teamwork because no one person can come up with all the answers. And last is a piece of technology that's really important to us, which is computer-aided design. And I'm gonna show you two examples of that. So this is the conceptual design that, the, that was my colleagues, um, the more senior engineers at the lab came up with. So this is um, what we already showed on the, the whiteboard. The sun is over on the right here. This is the shield made out of carbon-carbon foam. Here is um, our antenna, and this I'm going to call the base of the antenna. And down here is the electronics box. So there's our solar radiation coming from the right. This part is blocked by the, the shield, and everything below the blue dotted line is in the shadow of the spacecraft shield. But the um, full solar radiation does strike the antenna and the base of the antenna. You're gonna have conduction, which is gonna move heat down through the, the whip and the base down into here. And there's the electronics box. The distance from here to here is only 10 inches. And so we have to go down from an extremely high temperature, which I'll tell you the number in a second, to someplace 10 inches away, and it has to drop to less than 100 degrees Celsius. Oh, I forgot to mention the, the other part of the heat transfer, which is radiation to space. So there, um, heat only goes from a hot place to a less hot place. So the sun, the surface of the sun is 5,000 Celsius. Our antenna, uh, we don't, I'm not, I haven't told you yet what, how hot we think the antenna was gonna be. It's certainly gonna be um, less than that because there are no metals that, that stay solid at 5,000 Celsius. So heat will go from hot to less hot. And then space is near absolute zero. So heat is going to go from less hot to super cold. But if we don't do anything else, the electronics are going to overheat. So uh, an integral part of the, this concept is that the, the antenna will have its own little shield. And that's going to help it to radiate um, some heat off to the sides. And it's also going to put the base of the antenna in shadow so it won't heat up enough as much. And so what we're hoping for is that it will cool down uh, as you move down the base of the antenna, it will cool down. Uh, we're also adding insulation. I, I can't show it here because these, it's really small, but in, in between these metal parts are, are um, parts made of insulation that slow down the conduction of the heat. So that's the concept. And then the next thing they did is they used CAD software um, called SolidWorks to make a 3D model. And I'm going to actually just briefly show you the model. This is the model of the antenna. So there's the two meter long whip and the shield. It's at, it's, it ha it's at an angle. So that's why when the sunlight hits it, some of it is radiated off to the sides and under the shield is the base. And these small parts um, connect different metal parts. And in between them, you have this um, ceramic insulator. 
so that in no place um, is there metal touching metal um, during the, the path that the heat uh, travels through. And there's lots of other details that I don't have time to go into, but our, here's our electronics box down here, and it has a, a circuit board in here that processes the signals from the, the voltage probe, the antenna. So it's, it's a nice sounding design. It follows the physics. It seems like it'll work. It's a good idea. But how do we know if it'll work? So another CAD tool comes into play now, and that's CAD thermal modeling. Uh, and there are specialized engineers who are, who, who are thermal engineers, and this is what they do. Um, they use software, and they make a, a 3D model of the um, antenna as well. It doesn't have nearly as much detail, but it doesn't need it for this purpose. And they put in the model, the materials that the other mechanical engineers chose. So these are the materials that they chose originally. Um, the shield and the whip are made of a very exotic metal called niobium that melts at 2350 Celsius. The, sa the insulator that's going to be in between these metal parts is synthetic sapphire. And you can see the, the melting temperature of that. And then other parts of the antenna that we expect won't get so hot are titanium and stainless steel screws. And finally, when we get down here near the electronics box, we use aluminum. And so the thermal engineer plugs this information into the model, also puts in the 650,000 watts per square meter of energy coming from this side and the cold of space all around here and even the temperature of the spacecraft which is sitting under the um, instrument and they run this software they run this program it can take a long time it's a lot of number crunching it can take um, you know a day or two um, hours and hours of running and it outputs a temperature um, profile of the antenna and so what it says is that the, re the regions that are red are around 1200 Celsius. And that means the, the shield and the, and the um, whip. And so we're okay because niobium won't melt at 1200. Um, the yellow areas with the titanium are below 900, no problem. Same with the stainless steel screws. And when we get down to the electronics, we're below 100 Celsius, which is where we wanna be. And it's not a problem for aluminum. So we presented this to NASA, as well as lots of other things in the proposal, and they awarded us the money to do the project. And so then it was time to get to work. And I believe that this was in 2012. I joined the project in 2014. Um, lots more work had been done, thermal modeling and designing. And I, my first task was to do a test, an actual test on real pieces of metal and ceramic. Um, to verify that the design was sound and that the thermal model made sense. And so there were two goals to this test. One was to collect real temperature data and, and help the thermal engineer support the model. And then to make sure that the material survived, that nothing warped or broke or cracked or melted. And Tim mentioned travel before, and this was um, the most exciting trip I've gotten to do in my career, which is to go to France, where they have this amazing facility. It's the largest solar furnace in the world. It's a parabolic mirror built into an eight-story building. And um, what you don't see behind the picture is a whole field of giant mirrors that are taller than a two-story house, uh, 60 of them and they direct the sunlight to the parabolic mirror, which then focuses its light on a little vacuum chamber in this building. And this is our test piece. Um, it's, it doesn't look that much like the antenna because you can only fit a very small object inside the chamber, but it has a niobium shield, a titanium um, base, and um, titanium clamp with the two stainless steel screws in it. Uh, remember this um, part, because it'll come up later. And these wires are the temperature sensors that, that are connected um, underneath here. This is while we're running the tests. 
looking from the back of the chamber. So you can see some of the sunlight leaking through um, this gap in the door. And there was a window in the back of the chamber. And here is the, um, the shield glowing red hot. So we did the test uh, and did, how did we do? So we got good data, temperature data. We got up to 1200 Celsius. Um, that's the, the sheet, one part of the shield. Uh, and then other parts of the shield were cooler and going on down um, to the clamp and so forth. And so this is good looking data and the thermal engineer took it back and, and analyzed it and used it to tweak the thermal model. And then the other part is, did, uh, did the materials survive? So here's the test assembly after the test. Um, the shield looks fine. I don't see warping, cracking. Um, the titanium base looks okay. But there's something a little weird here on these screws. It doesn't look quite normal. And you look closer, it looks like something has melted right around where the screw, and the stainless steel screw and the titanium meet. And in fact, they were welded together. We put a screwdriver in here, we couldn't unscrew them. And so this is a problem. We did not pass this test. We came back to California um, and we need to figure this out. Um, I'll go ahead just yet. So, going back. So we consulted with all of the mechanical engineers, the, the most experienced ones, and really none of us had um, a good idea of what was happening. We also consulted with a, um, a specialist in metallurgy from NASA, and he couldn't really help us either. Um, so we decided to really go back to square one, and, and that is, could we reproduce the problem? And then from there, we could try to understand it. So we went to a facility um, in Sacramento, and we used a, um, a vacuum oven to reach really high temperatures. And we used the same little, uh, an identical little test piece. And so what we did is we took it up um, higher and higher temperatures. And we, we wanna know if something's gonna happen when we get higher and all the way up to 1000 C, it's okay. And then sure enough, at, at 1100, this same little bead of melted material appears. Um, not quite as bad as we saw, but the other test went up to 1200. So we took it up another 100 degrees and at each temperature, we're leaving it there for a whole hour. And look what happened. Um, the whole thing got destroyed. The screws are gone. And the titanium piece is, is just a mess. And there's just, um, shards and flakes of metal all over the place. Notice that the, the, the ceramic is fine. What in the world is going on? Well, the engineer that worked at this facility, we showed it to him and he said, I know what it is. And he goes back in his office and he comes back with this old book that looked like it was printed in like 1948 called the Brazing Handbook. And he flips to a page and he shows us and he says, this is what it is. And if you ever take material science, you'll see something like this. It's a phase diagram of iron and titanium. And what it shows is that iron and titanium, if they're combined in a certain way, the combination will melt at 1,085 degrees. And that's what happened. And so we discovered that our choices of materials were not gonna work. We did not pass the test. So we changed the um, materials. We got rid of titanium and stainless and substituted for them an, uh, another exotic uh, metal called molybdenum. And it's much more expensive. It's much more difficult to work with, but we ended up making all the other parts out of molybdenum. I don't have time to go into it today, but we did pass the test and those materials survived. And to make a long story short, in 2017, we had four antennas ready for flight. I got to go to the East Coast and help put them on the spacecraft. There are two of the antennas. And as, as um, Tim said, um, got to go to the launch. So it was a really exciting um, project to work on. So just in summary, um, some of the themes of this test, of this, of this, um, there's no test. 
of this uh, presentation are that we had to understand our physics, the creativity and our experience and teamwork and problem solving. And then three different disciplines in engineering that I that were a big part of our effort were mechanical design, thermal modeling, and test engineering. So it's time for your questions now. Um, I'd be happy to correspond with any of you. If you have questions, I can point you to resources in, the, in this career field. Just copy down my email address and I'm ready for questions. That's great, thanks David, that, that was really awesome. I mean, I, I've, I work on Parker Solar Probe and I, I still, and then, you know, found that to be really enlightening. I like the fact that one of the engineers pulled out this old book and referenced a, uh, you know, some old data that uh, helped you guys put your finger on the problem. That's really awesome. Okay, I'll, I'll start to uh, feed you some questions that folks have sent in via chat. Here's one. Why isn't tungsten used on the antenna given its melting temperature of greater than 3000 degrees C? We thought of tungsten, we even bought some tungsten. Um, tungsten is very hard, very difficult to machine, and it's very heavy, very dense. And so niobium was a better choice, even though its uh, melting temperature isn't quite as high, it's a lot less dense. And saving weight is really important for space missions. It's a great question. Let's see. What is the temperature rating of carbon carbon foam? How much does it cost to make and what makes it so special? So the carbon carbon foam um, is part of the spacecraft and, the, and I should have mentioned the spacecraft was made by the Applied Physics Laboratory uh, at Johns Hopkins University. So I can't answer your questions. Um, I don't know exactly how hot it can go. Um, I, I don't know how it's made. Um, I just know that it's pure carbon and they turn it into a foam and I did see it. It's very lightweight. And, and I do know that the front of the shield, which, which they painted white, gets to approximately the same temperature as our antennas, um, which is about 1200 C. So um, I'm sure if you look it up online though, you can, you can get the actual answers to your questions. How did your unique path to space physics inform your perspectives? And this is kind of a continuation of that same question. Do, do you find that you can approach problems differently than others in your field because of your background? That's a great question. Um, I do think that my background in science helped me in terms of um, methodical thinking and, and, and planning out testing um, protocols and so forth. And I think that my experience as a teacher helped with my communication skills, um, which is something that's not often mentioned in, in engineering, but it's extremely important. Um, when I went to Berkeley, uh, it was mandatory for all engineers to take a communication course, which focuses on writing and speaking. And um, they don't require that anymore, which I think is a shame. Mm. As far as my thinking process, um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, whether that's, whether there's something really different of how I approach things compared to my colleagues. And everybody has a different thinking process and that's what's great about working in teams. How do you feel getting a graduate degree shaped your career aside from uh, getting you back into space work? That's a really interesting question. The, um, the common belief in industry is that when you get a, a master's degree and you go to apply for a job, they bump your salary up. But they don't do that at the Space Sciences Lab. <laughs> so the extra courses that I took were, were very valuable. I took, um, for example, a course in vibration analysis, which we do. Um, but to be honest, uh, I would still be able to do my job with, with just a bachelor's and most of my colleagues just have a bachelor's. Well, here's a good question. We talked a lot about assembling the spacecraft, but have you gotten any data back from the probe? Yeah, um, well, of course, the scientists have gotten tons of data and um, 
I'm not involved with that because I've moved on to other projects. Um, but I've been keeping my eye on the temperature data. And so um, I'm glad that you asked that question. Uh, let's see. Can you still share my screen? Yes. Okay. So what I haven't showed you yet is the, um, the orbit plan, uh, the trajectory design, which is a really important part of the mission. Um, so it left Earth um, a little over two years ago. It flew by Venus and used a gravity assist from Venus to bend its course and slow down a little bit to get into this um, elliptical orbit around the sun. And so the first um, perihelion or closest point to the sun was here um, in the fall of 2018. And then it went three orbits like that. And then it hit, um, not hit, it went by Venus again and bent it into the next one in. And it did two more orbits there. And it just did the third level um, last week, as Tim mentioned. So we have temperature data from those three levels. It's going to keep going inwards um, and reach um, its closest orbit in 2024. And that's what we designed to. That's where we expect the shield to go up to 1200. So here's the temperature data for the first um, six orbits, the first, the, I should say, the first six perihelia um, for antenna number one. So the first three orbits were at minus 20 Celsius. The sec next two were a little below zero. And the, the third position that we just got to was a, a bit over 20 degrees Celsius, which is like room temperature. So how does that work with um, the model, the thermal model? So here are the temperatures I just showed you. I graphed them um, starting at about 17 solar diameters and then 13 and now 10. And here's the thermal model. And so we're cooler than the thermal model which is great. So um, definitely wonder, you know, why the thermal model is not accurate. But also I'm a little concerned because this is going up at a steeper slope. You notice that the model shows that it gets steeper as we get closer to the sun. And so what happens if this gets even steeper? Um, might we go above 90 Celsius, which is our limit before we get to five solar diameters? So um, I think this, the thermal engineers and the scientists are going to take a close look at this, though there's really nothing we can do. We just did our best um, to design it using everything that we had um, and many years, uh, a lot of effort, and we hope that it will do what it's supposed to do. But the, the nice thing about how this is um, designed is that we go in a little bit at a time. So we get what data we can until and if it, it fails. Um, I would say that from this data that it looks like we'll get it, we'll certainly get at least two more levels in before it gets up to 90 and, and, and hopefully more. You know, we, you don't, we don't know exactly how this curve is gonna end up. But that's the question right now that I have in my mind. Well, that, uh, this next question sort of comes on the tails of that is what will happen after 2024? Will the probe burn up in the sun or will it be able to withstand higher temps? Let me go back to the, the picture of the whole spacecraft. So in order to protect the spacecraft, it always has to face the sun. So it orbits around the sun and keeps the, the shield pointed at the sun. And that pointing is maintained by a series of little thruster um, motors, thrusters <laughs> that squirt out propellant and make fine adjustments to keep it pointed. If it's still um, working after, after the last planned orbit, um, NASA often um, extends the mission and lets the scientists keep um, studying. So they might wanna stay in the same place or maybe they'll wanna try to go even closer. But at some point, the thruster propellant is gonna run out. And that means that the spacecraft will no longer be able to stay perfectly pointed at the sun. And, it, and at some point it's just gonna drift to the side a little bit. And at that point, you're gonna have all these materials that are not, that cannot withstand those temperatures, aluminum and um, copper and 
some polymers and all the computer parts, and they're gonna get really hot and eventually just vaporize. But what, what I find really um, magical is that our pieces of niobium and molybdenum are not going to melt, they can handle it. And so you're gonna have little independent pieces of metal orbiting the sun for who knows how long after that. Wow, that's interesting. You know, here's a, here's a question um, about the orbits. You know, why does Parker Solar Probe, so many orbits gradually getting closer and closer? Why does it get closer and closer? Yeah, like what, you know, you, looking at that orbit plot you had, you can see it's like it gets closer and closer and closer. And why are there so many different orbits? I guess maybe the, 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 the questioner is wondering like, why isn't the same orbit every time? Or why is, maybe why doesn't it just go right to the closest approach or something like that? So from an engineering standpoint, I think it's because if it went straight to the closest and, and, and the antenna didn't survive, they would get no data. And so by inching closer and closer, they're getting data, then they go to the next one, and they spend more than one orbit at each place. So they're collecting extra data. But I also think that the scientists would say that they're not only interested in what's going on at the closest place. They wanna be able to map these physical um, quantities um, throughout space. Um, and so that's what they're doing. And I, I haven't mentioned, but there's, there's quite a number of other instruments on the spacecraft, particle detectors, magnetometers, um, there's a camera um, and, and so forth. And by the way, a shout out for UC Berkeley. We are, we designed or are managing more than half the instruments on the spacecraft. Go Bears. Um, yeah, here's a good question. You know, you mentioned these pieces will, will sort of exist orbiting the sun for a long time. And I, I myself was wondering like, are we ever, is everything just gonna eventually burn up? So that will the orbit eventually take it into the, you know, too close, but Maybe that will take a really long time. Yeah, um, I'm not an expert on orbital mechanics, but there is dust around the sun that I, if, if, if the orbit behaves as, as it does for satellites around Earth, um, the small amount of, of matter that is there in the solar atmosphere will gradually slow down these objects so that they eventually would fall into the sun. But my understanding is it's gonna take a very, very long time. I mean, hundreds of thousands or even millions of years, I think. Maybe a future Star Trek episode will have Parker Solar Probe on it. That would be great. Um, I just wanted to echo Claire had put into the chat Folks, if you haven't had a chance to yet, please fill out our interest form so that we can let you know when the next supper will be. So please give that a shot if you can. Let me see if there's any more questions. Oh, here's a good question. Was there a course on your path to completing your master's that you look, look that you took that later became more helpful than you originally thought? And yeah, maybe we'll, he, maybe we'll finish with that question. Okay. I also want to say one little thing afterwards. Um, heat transfer is required of all mechanical engineers. I didn't enjoy it all that much. Um, it was hard. <laughs> and yet it's the textbook that I most often go to since I left school. And um, I find it fascinating now. So um, the last words I wanted to leave you, you with um, are that, you know, when people hear that I am a mechanical engineer and that I work on getting space stuff into space, um, they're, you know, they get really excited. They, they think it's fantastic. And I agree with them, but um, what I want to say is it's, it's not easy to get through engineering school and get your degree. That is indisputable. But once you have an engineering degree, 
I don't think it's any more difficult to get a job in space engineering than in any other kind of engineering. Um, so don't let the amazingness of it discourage you. Um, what, what we are looking for is what any other firm or company is looking for, and that is people who are dedicated, hardworking, have good communication skills. And if you graduated, that shows that you can be an engineer. So um, good luck to all of you. And um, as I said, feel free to email you if you want to con uh, correspond with me. Great, thanks, David. Um, actually, we've got a couple minutes. Uh, should I show the launch video? video? <laughs> sure. <laughs> and finish with that. This is the launch of Parker Solar Probe that was taken by a friend of mine. Um, Night launch, great. My goodness. Oh, right up to the cloud cover. Oh, there you go. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, David. Thanks again. I, I really enjoyed your presentation.